Welcome back. This question has appeared once again. What is the syllabus for midterm exam? Midterm. We'll discuss this during the review session. If you do not get your answer from the course end of then. Now, we talk about architecture and requirement, designing an architecture, and documenting architecture. So there's something called an architecturally significant requirement, and in short we call it an ASR. Where do you get them? Well, you go to probably hire one of those shepherd dogs, uh, dogs an Alsatian, who will go around smelling them out for you. Very difficult, extremely difficult job. An architect does not come to know the requirement easily. Least of all, you don't get them on an order letter from a customer, nor do the customer call you. Uh, the customer calls you and has a sitting with you and tells you these are architecturally significant requirements. Please go ahead. There will be a lot of requirement documents. The customer will give you a lot of information about what functional requirements are there, how these are to be executed, and in between the lines. Okay, again, I'm told I'm not being heard. Mm. Is there anybody who can hear me? Oh, yes. There are very many people who can hear, so my friend here who cannot hear me is nice to meet Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, enough people hearing me now for me to be happy. Okay. Yeah. We were we have requirement discussion sessions. How are they different? Uh, I could not understand the question. There's a question says we have requirement discussion discussion sessions. How is it different? Oh, you have requirement discussion sessions. In your company, you sit down with a customer who tells you the requirement. When they tell you about requirements, most of the time they are telling you about functional requirements. I do not doubt your customer may be very intelligent, employing a lot of uh, software architects. Yeah, some very nice points have been put here, and uh, I'll be taking them up automatically as we move around. So, somebody says that an, a, a startup may not be able to employ an architect. There was a startup a couple of years ago, they called that product Facebook. There was another one, they called that product WhatsApp. WhatsApp, they call the product WhatsApp. Somebody's talking about UTG tree. Yes, we have a lot to do with UTG tree. Don't bother about it. Just okay. So they did not employ architects. How many of you drive a car? I don't have a voting panel here, but I'm sure a number of you drive a car. Do you hire a, hire a driver? Many of you don't hire a driver. So then you said, well, then how do we drive? The question is the same. How do you do an architecture if you don't hire an architect? How do you drive if you don't hire a driver? Well, you drive. You are the driver. So very often, these are rules. These are not uh, people who are born differently. So somebody plays this role. Somebody has to do an architecture. So an architect could be the product owner, could be a designer, could be a developer, could be a programmer, could be anybody. But then 
the role of an architect is very much there. So you have meetings, you have requirement meetings. The customer talks about requirements. The architect listens to them and finds out from these requirements which of the requirements are architecturally significant. Those of you who have gone through the video lectures provided with this would have a better idea. If not, after this session, please go ahead and watch the video. Sometimes an understanding of the business goals itself will provide you hints about the, uh, the, the thing, um, architecturally significant requirements. The business will not do well if the client cannot conveniently use the website to place the order. So, usability of the website could be and uh, could be an artifact, uh, architecturally significant rule. So, how do you capture an ASR in a utility tree? So, let us understand what a utility tree is. Like any tree, you start with the root of a tree. So, there's a very nice question here, how do you convert requirements to business goals? The reality is you don't. You convert business goals to requirements. Okay, you have business goals. After all, all these applications, somebody bankrolls it, somebody pays for it. And there's no question of having any requirement if there's no business goal behind it. So, business goals drive requirements, not the other way around. Okay, somebody has just asked what is an ESR. It's an architecturally significant requirement. There are requirements. Some of these requirements are significant from the point of view of developing an architecture. Oh, somebody says money, money, money. And money is not everything and we'll get into philosophy there. So we can't help it. But, you know, sometimes somebody's business, normally they say business, the purpose of business is to make profit. Sometimes you may be in the business of doing altruistic work. You may be in the business of running a government. So, the point is, whatever business you are in, the business has its objective. The business of the transport department may be to provide good roads. So, to provide good roads, what do we do? You may be in the business of making the world a happier place. Okay, then with that in mind, what do we do? So, at the root is definitely the business goals. And these, as you branch out in the tree, the first set of branches are the various quality attributes. And we keep repeating the same names again and again, but the, when you see things from an examination point of view, please stick to the quality attributes which you study in this course. Uh, you can name a few hundred quality attributes, but they're just about less than a dozen that we do in this course. We talk about availability, we talk about performance, we talk about uh, interoperability, we talk about maintainability, we talk about security, we talk about testability. So this is the type of, so these will be the main branches of our utility tree. And to achieve each of these, there will be some use case stories. We studied scenarios in the previous session yesterday. Yes, it's totally on the professional judgment of the architect. And the architect with his technical knowledge will make a judgment as to which of these requirements are architecturally significant. Then he will brainstorm from them with the stakeholders. It's not as if, you know, he will take, he'll be a dictator who will take a decision and roll it down to everybody. But he will discuss it. He'll have to explain. He'll have to justify. He'll have to prove that if I take this decision, I'm going to get this result. And he'll have to deliver the result. So, this utility tree has the root is the requirement. Then you have the quality attributes, other branches, and the sub branches are the scenarios. And when you finish this course, we'll be talking about cost and risk and things like that. But at present, the utility tree consists of the business requirements, which are uh, conducted by certain quality attributes. The quality attributes are delivered through certain scenarios. So when you want to say that I want this quality attribute to be satisfied, 
you'll have to indicate a scenario. And for the scenario, if you have missed the last class, there's no point in discussing, but it's got to do with the source of stimulus. Stimulus acting on an artifact in an environment to produce a response which is measurable. The measurement of the response is the measurement of the quality attribute that is required. Now, you have a design strategy. You have something called attribute driven design methods. And there are steps to be followed in architecture driven design methods. Attribute driven design methods. Now, the nice case somebody asked that if I'm developing a web application, do I look for uh, inputs from various people on the web? We have talked about stakeholders. See, you're developing an application, and let's look at an application on the web. Say you are doing an application for Flipkart. Who are the stakeholders? Definitely the people who are likely to be the buyers, and your various segment of buyers. You'll do a study as to what are the type of people who buy from you. You'll definitely do some sort of a survey with them. But then don't forget your other stakeholders. You have your marketing department. The people who are interested in selling, they will the you'll have the maintenance people. You'll have the CEO of the company who, who's interested in the amount of money you'll be spending. So this is attribute driven, ADD is attribute driven design method, not the architecture. ADD stands for Attribute Driven Design Machine Method. It's, uh, you'll be studying this even in OAD. You look for attributes and your design has to meet the attribute. Attribute in our case here is a quality attribute. So say you want performance. So your design is driven to provide performance. You want security. Your design is driven to provide security. So this is how an architect goes about designing. He has to explain as to why he's taking decisions in terms of the attributes that he's trying to satisfy. Now, you know, this is given in much more detail in the pre-recorded uh, pre session, so I would request you to go through it. Now, documenting of software architecture. One of the very important part of documentation is making views, and we'll be discussing views again in a subsequent session, there are pre-recorded lectures available on views. We had a mention of views last time. Views are diagrammatic approaches to depicting the structure of a software system or an application or whatever system you are in. It has to be depicted to the public. People have got to be able to view it on a piece of paper or on, on a web page. And to be able to show the view, there are various structures. The structures have got to be depicted. So, which are the correct views to be, which will be able to express your structure is what the architect has to decide. There are some notations you'll be using. And then you build up a documentation package, the ISO standard for the documentation package we saw some time back. The architect will have to explain the logic behind his decision as to what drove him. So you'll have to say that these are the quality attributes that are required, these are the scenarios that were given, you'll have to present it on a utility tree, and then say that now to achieve this, this is what I'm doing. Now, sometimes the requirements keep changing. And somebody just mentioned it here in the chat box. Agile methodology, and my arrow is just going to point at Agile methodology. Now, Agile is a fantastic manifesto. Some of the biggest brains in the software industry at that particular point of time, who probably didn't meet eye to eye with each other, did not agree on 101 things, they got together in a, a very isolated place, and they took certain decisions, and they agreed on these decisions. And mind you, lots of discussions and lots of questions in question papers, does this tally with Agile? Does it conform to Agile? 
And it looks like nothing conforms to Agile, but the reality is Agile is all-encompassing. Agile really provides for everything. And, you know, you say that a friend of yours Okay, it's a bit disturbing, but uh, you know, I'll have to address uh, a particular segment of students once and for all. Uh, it sometimes sounds a little offensive, but I have not been hired to run a coaching center to coach you for an examination. So examination-oriented questions you'll have to avoid in my session. Ask somebody else in BITS how to run a coaching center. You can probably attend a coaching center who will prepare you and get you good marks in an examination. Please don't ask me the examination-oriented questions. We are studying software architecture. Okay, so let's stick to software architecture. You want to know about architecture, want to study architecture, we'll do it. <clears throat> but if you are focused on examination, well, you'll have some past students, probably you have a social network, get across to them, they'll give you sample answers, you'll get excellent marks without knowing anything about architecture. So let's not uh, uh, divert from a um, key theme. Uh, you know, we are not going to be able to address uh, people who are very keen because this is not a competitive examination based on which you are going to get a job based on the marks you get. So let's not focus on an examination orientation. I warned you even earlier that it's going to be very easy to score high marks in this subject without knowing anything about the subject. But if you ever want to be an architect, there's a lots of study you will have to do which will not get you any marks. I've shared my email ID in the past, but it's available. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, there's some very nice comment from Shruti there. Okay. So, let's get on to Agile. And I'm sure there are many of you who are practicing Agile. And those who are practicing Agile know what Agile is. Uh, going off the topic, some of you practice Agile by a mo early morning routine called yoga. Now, just because your body is Agile does not mean that you cannot take tough decisions. It doesn't mean you can, can't do tough things. It doesn't mean your bo body is not robust. Agility simply means an ability to fit into a situation which is changing all the time. Okay, you're a sharpshooter. You're a sharpshooter, you can take a target, point it and shoot. What about the sharpshooter who can shoot a moving target? Agility is about shooting a moving target. As the target moves, you shoot it. Now, what do these people say? What these people say is that software requirements are going to keep changing even while you develop the software. Architectural requirements may also change. But then, what do you do about it? Say you want to set up a building. You decided that it was to be a hospital. And just about when it was ready, you decided that you're going to change it to a school. Are you going to be able to change the building? No. Are there going to be compromises? Yes. There's going to be a big problem. So, though I'm agile, I'm willing to accept, yes, this building which was meant for a hospital will now be used for a school, yet I must accept that having accepted Agile as a methodology, there has to be some conformity to a norm. So, but a person who is not Agile will simply say, no, demolish the building, rebuild it again. A person who is Agile will have enough provision, enough thought process enough understanding to be able to see how the development thereafter can change to major building suitors. Now, yeah, somebody's put on the mic, please uh, keep it off. <coughs> okay, now, let us now say how much architecture can we have how agility accepts it? A brief example, a guideline for agile architecture. 
something nice from Charles Darwin here. You might like to read it. And this is the part that is relevant to us. So with architects, so with developers, those who are willing to adapt will survive. Uh, I've had a lot of my friends who left me by the wayside because they'd love to stick to COBOL and Fortran. We had enough of our friends who did not want to move beyond BASIC. There was a language called BASIC which had become very popular in small systems. There are people who still swear that for small customers, the best application system is Fox Pro or DBS. Now, you have to move on. Times are changing. You have good solutions which fit in today's environment. And we can have a long discussion on what is good, but then, well, the world is changing. So you have to adapt to the change. Now, agility talks about big responses to stakeholders. After, so an architect has to decide which other items which are less likely to change and build around those. He's got to be able to tell the probability or she of changes that are likely to take place, which will require the architect to change. So there are developments that may take place in the world. A new technology of or a new method of using the cloud may come up. Now, if you are used, uh, if you are using Amazon Cloud, you know that there is a company called Netflix which is exploiting Amazon Clouds in a very big way. Netflix had its initial problems, but it overcame them. And they use a concept called servlets. So once you came to know about servlets as an architect, you might like to bring it into your future projects. So now it didn't exist. Nobody had thought of it earlier. So what do you do about it? Will you adapt? Will you throw away a project? Okay, maybe you'll bring it into your next project. But you might, in today's world, there are applications that are being developed all the time. You look at something like WhatsApp or you look at Facebook. It's undergoing a change almost every week or every month. They're having releases even without the users coming to know that changes are taking place. So in a situation like that, even the architects gradually bring in changes. And sometimes they begin major changes and they have to work on a strategy to implement the change without the world realizing it. There's something called a software-oriented architecture, which allows you to mask an entire application and allow you to give a completely different interface outside. So SOA has become very popular because the architects found it as a solution to making changes in parts. So you had a huge Goliath of a system running, which you could not afford to change. You had a lot of applications which required a different interface. So you kept that stable and changed everything around it. So SOA, Service Oriented Architecture came up and you'll be studying more about it later. Now, the fact is that architectural decisions are taking, taken early. It's also a fact that only essential documentation is done early under Agile. It doesn't mean that you don't document. But the emphasis is not on documentation. You don't burden yourself with documentation. So what you do is you do the essential documentation with the plan to do the rest later. The priorities are different with Agile. So you don't document too much, you don't over document. You don't bother too much about the contract. You are bothered more about meeting the customer's requirement. Okay, you have a contract, but then you listen to the customer and you can have a correction 
internal law. You can say, okay, we have decided to change things and execute a new set of documents. You concern yourself with using good people, very good resources. If you are not being able to hear me, it's an isolated problem. You have to see about it locally. The good, uh, if, when you can't hear, the best place to go is audio, speaker and microphone audio, uh, audio test and run a test on your system. Okay. Documentation should be kept to a minimum. Documentation is necessary. It is required for sharing things with the other stakeholders. Now, somebody will say, how much is too much of documentation? Well, the point is, do the bare essentials. Do as little as possible. Keep the documentation for later. You must, every time you do a documentation, understand why you're doing it. You're doing it to commit yourself to certain work. You're doing it to share knowledge with other people who will be working on the project. Other documentation can be. So that way, architecture, the concept of doing architecture, making early decisions, does not in any way interfere with agility. Agility does not mean you don't plan. So to give you an idea, early in my career, um, well, let's say in the 80s, against a government project, you might be handing over some 20 books which are about this fact, fat volumes, and it would fill a library, and uh, the client would be very happy in issuing checks against them. And, you know, a full-fledged financial accounting software would consist of five to ten um, programs, ledger printing program, cash book printing program, the, the type of program that would deliver, but in normal documentation. That was the trend. So in today's world, you all realize that by comparison, you hardly have documentation. Much of the documentation is online. So, and most of the documentation is for sharing with stakeholders and developers. Much of your documentation is only is, um, your contracts between development teams so that they understand what to expect from another component. So this is the type of documentation that is required. Now, the manifesto, if you don't already know it, to wrote, you should learn it by heart. In an agile environment, we try to get the best people to do the job and give them precedence over processes and tools. Some company may say, you know, we've got a completely software-aided uh, software engineering tool. And what about the engineers? Oh, we have taken some freshers uh, from college so that we can have a large number of developers, but we give them good tools. <laughs> okay, somebody has asked a very good question which I feel I should address. In Agile, do we have rework? If there's a sudden change requirement, you know, you have rework, but you don't have code break. In a conventional environment, the world I belong to once upon a time, you know, you would develop the entire application as per order, as per the software requirement specification, and one fine day we go and deliver it to the customer. And the customer will write an equally thick volume as to what changes need to be made. And if you are working for a large company, you would be able to convey to the customer's chief that, listen, these are not a part of your requirements, so you have to pay a small bit extra. A small bit may be very big, may be very small. So when these all amount to changes, and a project which after one or two years of working was being delivered might have a huge code break. It might create a lot of sadness with the customer. There may be misunderstandings. There are situations where I've seen things going legal. So there are huge changes get involved. In an agile process, you have changes, but they happen all the time. Many of you, I'm sure, would be working as a part of Scrum team. This is a form of an agile implementation. And you will notice that almost every week and midweek, you have these stand-up meetings. You have your Scrum leaders. So the changes are taking place, but the changes, the reaction time is quicker. It is like driving a car. 
It's not like driving a Google car where you have to program everything in advance and let the car go on. You are there in the car and you can respond to changes. If you suddenly, if you're programmed um, uh, to go straight uh, uh, and uh, you find a fence on the way, you can apply your brakes and negotiate around it. That's what Agile is about. Now, in an Agile process, we'll, in any of the Agile process, you will always continue to have a working software, right, from day one. Let's put it this way. Perhaps God was Agile. Right from day one, when you were born as a child, you were a working human being. He made a lot of changes in you by the time you got old. But doesn't mean you were not working, eh? not for a single day. Did he sort of uh, pull you down and say, now you're not online. And then I'll put you up again after 12 hours, except if you've been in coma for 12 hours. So, if a working software is presented to the stakeholders all the time, a lot of documentation is not really necessary. You have essential documents. You should collaborate with the customer. That means you've got to be in touch with the customer in a continuous way. You've got to have the stakeholders on board with you. They've got to be involved. You've got to keep them involved rather than talk too much about negotiating contracts and signing at the bottom line. And then, it's not that you don't have a plan. You do have a plan, but rather than follow, just follow a plan, you respond to changes. You respond because very often your customer understands his requirement only when he sees something. So he sees the working software and then he says, oh God, no, this is not it. I think we've misunderstood or probably I'm misconveyed or he might blame you for not understanding the requirement properly. So, in very small projects, if there's something to be delivered in a week, you probably will not like to have a giant. But for any large project which spans a reasonable duration of time, Agile seems to have become the only alternative today. The variations in Agile, people fit it into their own requirements, the way their companies work. It's not as if companies don't have software requirements specifications. It does not mean that you don't have contract documents. It does not mean that you do not have handing overs, that you have to have compliances. But in spite of everything, you have to be agile. Yeah, there's some recommendation given on agile. There are some very good uh, books available. There are training programs available on agile. Here we've just summed it up quickly. You can the Agile Manifesto is available on a website. Um, I think uh, the website's name is probably agilemanifesto.com or something like that, where these principles have also been stated. They're the principles which help you go as per the Agile Manifesto. Continuous delivery of software should be there. You don't have uh, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a theory which says that one fine day the Earth and the universe came into existence. Well, if you try to follow the Big Bang theory while delivering applications, you will get a Big Bang. More often than not, the customer will get a shock. Yeah, somebody's already verified. It's agilemanifesto.org. So, now, in a continuous way, you keep delivering. So, the customer sees the working software all the time. And then you have, you welcome any changes. Anybody talks about change, welcome it. Because if he does not, if he keeps it in his heart and he lets you know only on the date of delivery, you might be in for a shock. You've got to have continuous delivery of software. In fact, if the software is working and it's, uh, you give the updates, that's the best way to work on it. You have something called DevOps, is the philosophy which is very, very uh, popular these, these days, which says that the operation people and the developers have got to work closely to each other. Over here we say the business people and the developers have to work closely with each other. The people who are developing the software, just to have a bit of a snipe on some of my friends here, they should not be people who are just appearing for an examination. There should not be people who are just looking for the salary at the end of the month. They should be motivated people. People 
who have made a passion of delivery. And most good software are delivered by passionate people. When they're working with the software, they don't have the salary in mind. They, they don't care what the customer is paying them. They are in for it because they wish to deliver. They, they just get involved with the software. It, um, I may dare say that these motivated people have some sort of a romantic engagement with their applications they are developing. That's the type of people we look for in an agile environment. You should always be willing to face your customer face to face. You know, there's a tendency, particularly among junior, junior developers, to avoid confrontation with anybody who will give you feedback. There's a fear of feedback. Well, feedback is not something to be feared. It's something to be confronted. Because that's the only thing that saves you from a doom. If you know that there's a precipice you're approaching, you can avoid falling into the precipice. The precipice is a sharp edge on the road or in a hill. And if you walk down there without getting feedback from your eyes, you'll fall down and probably die. So we say we have face-to-face -face conversation with the users so that you come to know of the pitfalls before you fall into the pit. Now, if the software is working, well, it works. And I can assure you, irrespective of anything else, Uh, uh, any other problems, the stakeholders and the customer then will cover you up because everybody is interested in working software. Today, how many of you have gone to the internet and tried to look for documentation for WhatsApp? So that gives you an idea of the importance of documentation. And a couple of years back, no customer of mine would be willing to release a bill without uh, documentation being handed over. Okay, there were lots of technical, there could be technical documentation, architecture documentation, there could be developer's documentation, but people said, no, there has to be an operator's documentation. There has to be a documentation given to the, uh, to the user. Where is the user documentation for WhatsApp? I'm yet to see a copy. So, you should promote sustained development. The sustained development means that the development should continue. You should be able to have it happening all the time to further the software. And there should be an attention to technical excellence, absolute perfection, good design. And we are not talking about only architecture. We are talking even about uh, the design uh, for your application design object oriented analysis and design. The best software in the world and the best code in the world is also simple code. Ashen Tate, uh, one of the great programmers of an era about 20, 30 years back, who wrote super code, uh, a software called DBase, said that complicated programs are the product of a complex mind. They only give rise to mistakes. The best coders write simple programs. He went on to explain that the best coders will write uh, code which will be understood by a school child. So people work in self-organizing teams. Yeah, somebody says that do it yourself. Videos have come out for WhatsApp type of application. So, teams look for, at regular intervals, teams try to become, uh, in fact, I've got some beautiful tips that are coming up in the chat side over here. I wish I could organize all of them and share it with your people. Super suggestions that keep coming along here. Good education for me, let's say. People thought that Agile was to be used for small projects, medium-sized projects, and not often for large projects. Today, it is realized that large applications, distributed applications, are good candidates for Agile. In fact, I would say that in a very small project, I would really look at Agile. I would rather look for the waterfall model, have a clear understanding and finish it off. Okay, simplicity.
with say I give you a, a small coding assignment where I tell you that I want a piece of code written in C to add two numbers. I wonder what agility will we'll talk about it. We'll have a clear cut understanding. I'll write down the requirement. You'll develop it, test it, and deliver it. Waterfall model. So, you know, for that type of application, waterfall still works. But the variations today in today's world, and we'll be studying more of these models in objectivity analysis and design. There's a lot of indulgence there on the unified process. Uh, the variations, the companies tailor development models to their own environment, to their own company, to their own projects. Product companies have got their own standards where they even make variations of scrum and they, uh, they build up the process models according to how their companies would like to do it. So they are all variations of agile. It is not plain when vanilla agile, but companies, all large companies, they have brought in the agile manifesto into the working of their own process models. Uh, when we talk about unified process, it's the uh, IBM Rational Group uh, initiative, and they have developed it to quite a degree on their own. Now, we talk about how much of effort should be involved in architecture. So your various projects, <clears throat> 10 KS lines of code. So KS stands for kilo, S stands for source. So kilo source lines of code. So 10 kilo source lines of code would be a small project, 100 kilo source lines and 1000 kilo source lines would be very big projects. So based on these various project sizes, there's a nice graph that's been drawn up. This is for the 10,000, this for the 100,000, and this is for the 10,000 uh, 10, source lines of code. Now, let's look at it. Now, this is the amount of time. If you spend very little time on Somebody in the company, they're using distributed agile, scaled agile. There are a number of nice suggestions over okay. here. That's why I love to keep uh, cut out of this chat site if I go through it at my leisure. So here, this graph, you try to see what type of effort you would like to use into architecture. Architecture, we talk about as initial planning, designing, as to how we go about it. If you put in no effort, it will be here. If you put in a lot of effort, it will be over here. Now, this is the raw, the amount of rework. If you don't put in any initial architecture in a large project like this, this is, say this is the amount of rework that you have to do. And if you do a very large amount of architectural input, then this is the amount of rework you may have to do. Now, for a smaller code, there will be less rework, and a much smaller code, there will be much less rework. And as you put in more architecture, you benefit from it. Now, if you add this curve with this curve, you get this curve. So in a small project, as you put, as you put in more time in architecture, the total time devoted it becomes very high, it just increases. Whereas in a large project, as you put in more and more time into architecture, the rework time reduces. So in a small project, the hotspot is here. This is the minima point. Here, this is the minima point, this is the minima point. So in a large project, a good amount of input into architecture helps reduce the project duration. See the rework from here, comes down right up to here. Whereas in a medium sized project, the rework only reduces from year to year. In a very small project, so you'll end up doing more work. So the moral of the story here is that in very large projects, architectural input in the beginning can really reduce your overall uh, point right from here to here. 
this is the sweet spot. So this is something you want to realize that architecture really cuts down on rework. <clears throat> Beautiful principle given here. Write for the reader. If the reader doesn't need it, you please don't write it. And I told you about 30 years back, we used to not write for the reader either. We used to write for our payment. Because if a shelf was filled up with our documentation, it was easy to get the payment. Today, everybody is becoming more intelligent. They realize they don't pay for the documentation, but they pay for the software. Now, agility and architectural evaluation. How does architectural evaluation work as a part of as an agile process? You have something called the ATAM, and we'll be studying ATAM in more details later. Architectural trade-off analysis method. And what we do is, as we proceed with architecture, we evaluate. When we evaluate, we get feedback. With the feedback, we change future decisions on time before they become too expensive to change. And we make trade-offs between various attributes as to what is really worth doing and what is not. And based on this, ATAM is a more elaborate process. You've got a lightweight process also, which we'll be discussing in this course. So this is how you go about taking care of your Vivero conferencing. This is an example given. You know, in this, um, this textbook of yours, at the back side of the textbook, there's a reference given to a website where you get all the case studies. If you cannot find them on your own, let me know. And uh, the case studies taken up by the authors, which in the early edition, somebody has got the old edition there, the case studies were in the textbook itself. But in the third edition, the case studies are not in the textbook. They have been put up on a website. So you go. Like in everything else, we have a top-down and a bottom-up approach. We can take these approaches to develop uh, the architecture. Trade-offs, we'll be discussing a lot of trade-offs. So we are in Agile, you do experiments, which are called spikes. In uh, architectural trade-off methods, we'll be trading off between various quality attributes. When you talk about trade-off in architecture, we are talking about trading off between quality attributes. If you want to have too much of security, you're going to suffer on performance. How much security are you willing to have to give up a little bit of performance is a decision the architect will have to take. How much of security you're willing to give up to enhance performance? Because you're working at a given budget. You, you might increase your budget and have a little a bit more of each. So these are the trade offs which we do. And while we do the trade offs, we experiment. We have small POC sessions. We try out certain things uh, to see, and we call them spikes in Agile. And based on the result, you uh, go back to your trade-offs and come back to your stakeholders and take decisions. So these type of things are, uh, will be in So these are the type of questions spikes will be able to answer. Would you distribute the database? Or would you keep a local flat file? What if you use uh, what Perl in place of Perl? So you do an experimentation and see the result. What type of quality issues does what Perl give you? How many participants can you try out on a single meeting server? You might do some experiments on the server and actually try it out. Spikes are POCs. In, I'm using my own language. POCs are proof of concepts. So in Agile, small experiments that you do are called spikes, which come back as a feedback to, for your stakeholders meeting to revamp your original decision on your architectural decisions or trade-offs. What are the ratios? How many database servers would you have? And ModPerl is a modified version of Perl. That's all. So you want to sell certain language decisions may have to be taken in the middle of a project, whether you'll use an enhanced version of a language or not. What are the implications?
तो सो मेकिंग द आर्किटेक्चर प्रोसेस एज जाइल डोंट रियली हैव टू रीइन्वेंट एज जाइल डोंट डू हैव टू रीइन्वेंट योर आर्किटेक्चरल मेथड्स दे आर वेरी मच एवेलेबल टू इच अदर वेब एरो इज द एक्सपेरिमेंट दैट इज टॉक्ड अबाउट हियर नाउ वी हैव अ स्मॉल गाइडलाइन हियर for agile architecture given by barry who we'll just take a quick look at it blend how to blend about it commitment and accountability the stakeholder should be critical about success you have to meet thresholds agree on thresholds you develop your system in an evolutionary manner in increments your iterative development most of our agile process are iterative in nature core capability should be fielded first so that you can adapt to changes and you grow in a gradual manner what's uh, whatsapp came up without pictures without videos without uh, documents it was plain when you saw It's something like a text box over here. In fact, when you look at a chat session here, uh, when I first started using WhatsApp, it looked exactly like this. Even didn't have a concept of sending. You just selected the participant and then you wrote a message and typed it in. And in the early versions of WhatsApp, they allowed only five user groups. Gradually, they increased to ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, fifteen. In fact, today I don't even know what the limit is. So, this is how. Uh, software grows, and some good early decisions taken by the team they really help to build up the application into a robust future. All the activities that are going on concurrently, the architect in close league with the project manager should uh, they they work out very harmoniously and they synchronize to make sure they have. Uh, concurrent activities taken up. So the author has put on a little bit of advice, which you can read in the textbook. Prepare, prepare to change and elaborate this architecture as circumstances dictate. As you perform your spikes and experiments, as as functional and quality attribute requirements emerge and solidify, which means you've got to be willing to change. There is no scope in today's world for rigid blockheads. who are not willing to change with the times and with the requirements customer expects your service providers and the developers to be open minded to be willing to listen to them and provide solutions which create a win win situation for both the developer and the client so with that we finish today's session and we do not meet each other next week we will only meet the week after again those of you who want to know the schedule it is then takshida and the announcements if you look up the schedule is given there we will be confirming to the schedule if there is any non conformance you will be informed well in advance of course there could be emergencies so please put out any number of points here your next class is in 5 minutes with someone else so for the next 2 minutes i'll be keeping the chat site open it gives me two weeks to read through it and come up with suggestions so please don't hesitate write down everything you feel like over here and put it and in future sessions i might allow a little bit of interaction i might have some question on some polls voting those sort of features i will be putting up i wanted to quickly cover a lot of ground in the course in these first three sessions so that you have good material to read you have half the textbook to read now and more than half probably of the course for the midterm exam has been covered for those of you who are much concerned about the examination whatever we've done up till today is definitely in the course for the midterm exam so if you are in a hurry to start studying for the exam the time is now thank you very much it's a great pleasure to be interacting with so many developers and people of our fraternity who are going to make a difference to the world by now you must have understood why and architecture is so important and why you need to put in a lot of effort into this course thank you very much